Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the least profound recording of Brahms's first and third symphonies that you'll ever hear. And you're going to love it. I mean, it's just terrific. It's Edward Gardner with the Bergen Philharmonic, an orchestra that's really sort of like, you know, making a splash lately among the second tierish kinds of orchestras in the, in the provinces, as we call it. But no, they're really terrific. Anyway, it's on Chandos. It's 81 minutes and 25 seconds of Brahms symphonies with exposition repeats in both first movements, which means the first symphony particularly is kind of long, but oh my God, are these exciting performances. And they have no pretensions whatsoever. When I say they're not profound, that doesn't mean they aren't marvelous. They really, really are. Gardner conducts like, I mean, it's fresh, it's lively, it's transparent. The music just flows along. It has, it has no, no transcendental pretensions whatsoever. And my God, what a nice thing to hear. You know what these performances really sound like? If you have Bruno Walter's first cycle with the New York Philharmonic, it's that kind of Brahms. That is beautifully balanced, just, you know, he just plays the music. I mean, let me, let me tell you a little story. I'll tell you a little story that sort of summarizes the whole thing. There's a wonderful moment in the Maria Callas masterclasses where she is coaching some like mezzo soprano and I think she's singing oh I don't know maybe Pace Pace Mio Dio from La Forza del Destino something like that um, I don't remember the exact aria but at one point the the hapless student emits this grotesque screech and Kala stops her and says what the hell was that <laughs> and and the student looks at Kala and says hopefully it's a cry of despair and Callus just looks at her and says, it's not a cry of despair, it's a B flat. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of performance it is. There are no cries of despair here, masquerading as, as you know, some foolish distortion of, of what Brahms wrote in an effort to make an interpretive point. Gardner makes his interpretive points. He has plenty of interpretive points but he does it within the context of being very solicitous of what Brahms actually wrote, making sure that an allegro is really an allegro, keeping those middle movements just flowing along. It's just delicious. Let's, let's talk about these things in, in, you know, bit by bit, just so you get a sense of what I mean. The first symphony. Well, the first symphony, listen, I love the granitic approach. I love Klemperers. I love the Hamburg Fortwängler. I mean, I like that German rock solid crazy, but not all the time. There's more to the music than that. It's that simple. And that is one particular interpretive niche. There are others. Um, some people might call these performances more classicizing. I don't think so. I think they're very romantic in their impulsivity, in their excitement. I really do. The first movement begins with an introduction. Now, nowadays, most people take that introduction uh, not in a cosmic pounding with a timpani, like, bang, bang, like, the, like the thud of death, of doom. No, not like that. It's just, it's just, it's impressive and it's powerful, but it moves. It really moves. And then when the Allegro launches, wow, boy, it just flies along. And this is one of those movements that can really lay there. It can just die a thousand deaths. Well, it doesn't. It just soars. It really does. And even with the exposition repeat, it makes more sense than in 95% of the other performances you're going to hear because it has all this energy. And even if it goes back to the beginning, it still retains that, that, that propulsion. Now, there are moments that I think, you know, Gardner could have done a little bit more with. They could have stood with a little bit more rhetorical emphasis. For example, the moment of recapitulation. 
you know, when it just, it's, it's building and building and seems to overshoot its mark, and then all of a sudden, da-da-da, he kind of, he kind of skates over it. The music spills into the recapitulation rather than crashing into the recapitulation. But it's all of a piece. It works very, very well. Now, the second movement is just a beautiful flowing on Dante, the scherzo-ish thing, <laughs> because Brahms didn't really write normal scherzos in his symphonies are more like intermezzi. Oh my goodness, it's just beautiful. It's as innocent and fresh as the spring morn. I won't even put the ing on morn. It's a morn. It's just delicious. And the middle episode, oh my goodness, it just takes flight. It, it, it's so breezy and lovely and so not heavy and sticky and galumphy. You're not going to believe it. And the finale is marvelous. And here I think, you know, Gardner's, Gardner's approach really pays dividends because the actual tempo is swift, as you might expect, but it's not ridiculously fast. It's not, it's not glib. It's not superficial, if you want to call it that, the opposite of profundity. But what happens is that as we get closer to the coda, the tempo gets a little broader. Gardner is not immune to the music's need for grandeur. It's just that he gets there by being a little quicker at the beginning so that he's got a little room to broaden at the end without losing the momentum. And it's marvelous. It's absolutely marvelous. I just came away with it thinking, boy, I can listen to that all over again. And I did. And it was just as marvelous. Now, the third symphony, that's the one that everybody screws up, as we all know. And Gardner doesn't. First of all, the, the opening movement, which is, you know, what is it, just Allegro con Spirito or something, or con Brio, or something like that. It has some sort of, there we go, Allegro con Brio. And then un poco sostenuto. And then tempo one. Yes, of course. Well, we finally have the brio. I have never understood why so many conductors will not charge out of the gate at this opening. I mean, that's what Brahms wrote. It's clearly what Brahms wrote. You have these two chords, which do not get a crescendo until the end of the movement. Note. And then it's... Why people do it? I mean, I don't know where the brio went. It's supposed to have a verve, and that's what this has. It has verve, lots and lots of verve. I love the verve. Now, the, again, the two inner movements are simply lovely. They are, they're, they're, you know, you cannot turn these pieces into, into Brucknerian adagios, the slow movements, particularly the third, although it does have that wonderful spooky episode in the middle of it, but it just flows the way it's supposed to. And the cello solo, the cello theme in the third movement isn't sticky. It doesn't make you want to like run out and get your deodorant and paper over your armpits because something's really amiss. No, it's beautiful. And the finale. Well, this is a really exciting finale and it's almost out of control. It's so quick, but it doesn't get out of control. And that's the point. It never does. I mean, the playing of the Bergen strings is really, really great in this. And that furious maelstrom in the middle of the movement, my goodness, it goes well, which only leads us to a beautiful coda. But there's, 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 there's nothing of the sort of late romantic decadence about this thing that we often hear in this symphony. I mean, you, you just play it. And, and you play it, you play it as well as you can, and you give it some energy and some, some thought. And it's, it's not like Gardner's rushing, or he doesn't pause now and again to sort of take in the scenery. He does all of those things. But within the context of an overall youthfulness and brightness, and I mean, it is an F major symphony after all, but it's not like it's supposed to be dead. It's wonderful. It's just wonderful. I loved this record. It was so refreshing. And it's marked as like Brahms Orchestral Works Volume 1 or something like that, which means we get more. I mean, dare I hope that we'll hear a second symphony that has a real surge of energy at the end of the coda, the finale? Well, we'll see. Let's hope. I mean, I, you know, you never know these days. But boy, oh boy. 
This was a wonderful thing. And it really makes me wonder, you know, why is Chandos spinning its wheels with John Wilson doing boring recordings of blockbuster repertoire when they've got this guy? I mean, he can play it just as quickly, but he's better. He's smarter. He's got more to say in the music, at least in my opinion, if you compare the two. But uh, wow. I, I, I delayed listening to this for the longest time. It was just sitting in my pile because I thought, oh dear, here we go again. More Brahms, more the same old, same old. Well, it's not. It is not the same old, same old. It is delicious, and it's delicious for its very lack of, of thick, heavy, gluey, spurious efforts at faux, at faux sublimity. Yeah. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.